Hi, this is Louisa Whitfield-Smith. I'm a library consultant with the Mississippi Library Commission, and I'm here today to talk to you about successful ways to transition to remote work at your public library. And right now, I am practicing what I will preach later in this webinar and showing you my face to build trust, probably also to show off my built-in, uh, which those of you who can't or choose not to see right now is a large uh, series of bookshelves with both books and albums on it. So. Why are we here today? Besides to look at the way I handle my stress, another topic we'll cover later today. We are here to discuss four strategies, which we'll get to, to help with this transition, not just for now, but for the coming one to two years to improve remote work possibilities at your library. Also a note for those of you joining us from outside the amazing state of Mississippi, we have expedited legislation here in the state that allow us to pay all of our staff their full salary during a state of emergency while they're sent home on administrative leave. One of the gifts of this legislation is it means that we can focus on the most essential services and providing them in the safest manner possible and can still pay our staff if they don't work their full hours. So, with that in mind, and if you have any questions, there's a link in the um, video description below to that expedited legislation if you're from out of the state, or if you missed it in the flood of information during the first couple of weeks of this crisis and would like to read it and you're inside the state, please click on the link below. Also, all links I mentioned during this webinar are linked in the description below for easy access for you. Also, please use the comments field. Even though this is no longer a live webinar, Comments are how we learn from each other. Chat is always my favorite section in a webinar. Okay, let's get started. As I said, this is my name. This is my email. It's louisa at nlc.lib as in boy .ms If you have any questions or ideas sparked from this webinar, please feel free to reach out to me at that email address. As I said, we're gonna be covering four strategies today about how to successfully transition to remote work. First, we'll talk about focusing on one to two essential services your staff can provide safely and remotely. Two, we will talk about identifying and removing barriers to remote work. Three, we'll discuss the importance of self-management and other emotional intelligence techniques that will help during this stressful time. And four, we'll end on the importance of weekly one-on-one -on -one check ins but first, let's take a test together. Can you multitask? Now, please be honest in the comment section below. Do you believe you're a multitasker? I have to admit before I took this test, I definitely thought I was a multitasker and some of us can't. So be honest below, let's take a test together. We're just gonna do a sample. This is a scientifically rigorous um, official academic instrument available in full 40 minutes, fair warning at supertasker.org org link in the bottom. So for this first part of the test, you are the door person at a nightclub. There are three doors to the club. A door flashes red if someone wants to enter. Your job is to let in cool people and block uncool people for coming in. So how do you know if someone's cool or uncool? Uncool people try and enter the club from the same door that was used two trials ago. Since your job is to block them, you should press the block key, which is the backslash located at the right of your keyboard by the right shift to block them or the Z to let in the cool people if they're coming in from a different door. Now, I would praise the space for demonstration, but wait, all those instructions you just learned, that's not what we're going to do. Instead, we're going to do it by audio clues. So this time, uncool people use the same password used two passwords ago. Cool people use a different password. Okay, let's get started. And you're gonna hear exactly how bad I am at this. Spoiler alert, is real bad, y'all. Ready? Two passwords ago is what we have to keep track of. Z to block, I mean Y to block, Z to let them in. O. Okay, letting them in. Mm -hmm. Z. Y. Yep. I think, okay, I'm gonna try it again. This time they're gonna let us know if we're correct or incorrect. Okay, first two we let in. P. In. O. In. P. Block. 
O. Y. I think I let that in. P. Y. O. Sorry. P. I think I let them in. Nope. Y. Uh, block. Nope. O. Mm, yes. P. Uh. Y. Yeah, that, that's seventy percent, uh, guys. I'm not great at this. Fair warning. Also, total spoiler alert. Not only am I not great at this, I once got 38% on this section of the test. Guys, there are only two options. 50% would be average. I am worse than average at this. But we are not done. <laughs> like, that was just a single task, y'all. As hard as it is for some of them, us named Louisa. We're about to try and do two tasks. Remember that first set of instructions I gave you. You're visually going to watch which door opened. If they try and come in that same door, we're going to get to the instructions. But we're keeping track both of visually what door they went into and the audio clue. So let's go to phase two. Okay, it's VIP time, y'all. They're very special. Clients need to use the correct door and the correct password to be let in. Block someone if they use the same door as the second to last person, but not the same password. So same door, different password, block. Or if they use the same password, but not the same door, block. So same password, different door, that's a block. Difference, block. However, if they use the same door and the same password, you let them in. Same, same, in. Or if they use a different door and a different password, you let them in. So same, same, different, different. They're cool, guys. Let them in. It's a Z. If they use the same door and a different password, or a different door and the same password, we get them the big old block. So get your fingers ready. Z to let in, Y to block. Watch how bad I am at this. Spoiler alert, I am not a multitasker. O. Okay, let them in. Mm -hmm. P. Mm -hmm. Y. Mm -hmm. Think so? Yeah. And that's just a four item sample, y'all. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. <laughs> How did that make you feel? How'd you do? How do you feel right now? I know the first time I took this test, I was really stressed out. My first clue that I was probably not a multitasker is that I, like, I closed my office door, I put on my headphones, I tried to come up with a system, I worked really hard to focus on it, but it stressed me the heck out. I know the first time we did this training, people all over the comments talked about how frustrating an experience that was. Now, there are some of you who might be cool as a cucumber and who are like, that was easy peasy. Well, congratulations, you are one in 50 people who can actually multitask per the study. Only about 2.5% of the population can successfully multitask without an increased error rate. If you, sir or madame, are one of those 2.5%, Please screenshot me your result from the end of the test and send it to me. I would say you get a prize, but life has already given you a prize. The important thing I need you to understand is the other 97.5% of us are stressed out and frustrated right now and had no idea what that test was doing. And it is a dangerous time to be distracted. Those of you who heard this webinar live heard my contractor show up unannounced knocking to do a safety feature on the outside of my house without giving me any warning in advance. And this slide was inspired from the first time he showed up at my house unannounced and interrupted a phone call with a mentor of mine. And my mentor did this amazing thing. He said, now is a dangerous time to be distracted. He asked me to call him back after I'd wrapped up with the contractor when I wasn't trying to multitask and to give it at least an hour to calm down and to focus before I called him back. Because we have workers in our libraries who have second jobs as bank tellers or as grocery store clerks, who have significant others, parents, kids, or roommates who are first responders, nurses, truckers, Instacart delivery people. And when they come home, they have to help them decontaminate. And now is not the time to have them be doing eight hours of work that they have to find undistracted time to do while trying to keep their family safe, their roommates safe for themselves. Again, let me say this, it is a dangerous time to be distracted. And for 98% of us, whenever we're asked to do more than one thing at a time, our error rate goes up. 
And I also want you to think about this not just for remote work, but for work in your libraries as we look towards return. Tana Taylor at the Tom Bigby Regional Library is doing this really smart thing. She's going to test it out and see, and she wants to talk to everyone on Thursday, but she's considering having designated hours for different tasks at her library as they gradually reopen. So having a curbside delivery time, having computer appointments time, having circulation time, so her staff aren't having to keep track of more than one thing when their building is open. So think about this not just for remote work, but for when your building reopens as well. Also a note, note how I say your building reopens, not your library. It's important that you use this language with your staff and with your funders and with yourself. Our buildings may be closed right now, y'all, but our libraries are absolutely open with our staff performing essential functions and all of our communities in need right now. So one more time, our buildings are closed, but our libraries are absolutely open. Now let's think about this. It's a dangerous time for your staff to be distracted. There's a lot going on. We haven't even gotten to the fact that we have sudden homeschool parents all over this nation who are inadequately prepared to do the work our awesome educators do on a daily basis. Thinking about all you've heard, consider it is better to have your staff work a focused two hours than a distracted four. It's not only safer, it's more effective. When you think about those two hours too, where possible, be flexible and where your staff schedules it. Now, if you have a meeting or if they're working phone reference hours or they're doing a virtual program, of course, have them have regular hours that are dependable for their fellow staff in your community. But if they're doing prep work for that or if they're doing email reference, consider having flexibility for when they schedule those two hours, maybe depending on their significant other or roommate schedule or when broadband in their apartment complex is less taxed or when their kids have gone to sleep. This might be the best time for them to do undistracted work, whether it's 10 at night or 4.30 in the morning. What works for them and you can give them that grace, please do. And you're asking, well, how can I know what work they're doing? This is the thing I want you to also hear. It is so important for you to trust your staff in remote work. Experts say that Overwork is more likely for remote workers than lack of productivity, especially for the first week of a remote work assignment. And this is taken from Fisher Phillips' excellent comprehensive and updated FAQs for employers on the COVID-19 coronavirus. Fisher Phillips does HR law, and this is an invaluable free re resource that is frequently updated. So your job is not to look for the slackers. Your job is to look for those who are in danger of burnout, who are overstressed and address their concerns appropriately. Keep an eye on the bigger picture and track overall productivity, not moment by moment activities. Here at the Mississippi Library Commission, at the end of the day, I send my hours to the day and major accomplishments. I don't give a blow by blow to my boss, Lacey Ellenwood, in which I say at 9.55 AM, I responded to this email with this exact wording. I give her the things that matter. Ask your staff for the what, not the how. So how are you gonna run a library with people only working two hours a day, giving them flexibility and when they schedule? Here's the big key. And again, this isn't just for remote work. This is as we look to reopen. Focus on one to two essential services your staff can provide safely and remotely. Let me say that again. Focus on one to two essential services your staff can provide safely and remotely. So that's my question for you, and please put it in the comments field below. What is the single most important thing your library can offer for your community during this time? You can email me your answer too. You just need to have an answer. And that's what you need to be communicating to your staff and to communicating to your funders. Because for many of us, it can be tempted to try to, we can be tempted to try and implement 15 or 20 new ideas at a time of real change. And that is not the way to keep your staff safe or to do any of those things well. And when you pick that one to two essential things you're doing as a library, play to your strengths. And this, what I'm about to say, will be familiar to anyone who's familiar with Gallup's Strengths Finder 2.0. In years of polling, Gallup found the most productive teams, one, have a clearly communicated mission and purpose. And that's that essential task I'm talking about, that you as a library are working together. 
and to accomplish. And when you have a single task, there might be something that you've always wanted to do that you think is important for your community, but seem too time intensive or too big to do, but you really want to do it. When you focus on one or two essential things, you can accomplish something like that as opposed to chasing 20 new ideas. Two, once you've clearly communicated and set that mission and purpose, allow your individual contributors to use their strength to accomplish that shared mission. And three, trust each other to do your jobs. As you pick what your remote work initiative will focus on, play to your library and your team's strengths. Next, strategy for success. Number two, you picked your task, you're ready to move forward, you have your overarching mission, you need to now identify and remove barriers to remote work. What is one thing that will keep your staff from succeeding at remote work? Now I know for many of you it is more than one thing, but think about that and put it in the comments below. How do you know? You don't know. What is the most common thing? Really consider using a staff survey to identify potential barriers to remote work. One barrier is reliable access to a laptop or device to use to do remote functions. And I don't just mean they have a laptop or a desktop at home. I mean they have exclusive access to it for the number of hours they need to do their job. So maybe they never had a problem doing remote work before, but now they have a significant other who's home doing remote work and kids who have schoolwork to do, and suddenly that one desktop has a whole lot of needs. Two, and this is the number one reason here in Mississippi per our last COVID-19 public libraries response survey that we identify as a barrier to remote work in the state, internet connectivity. Do they have reliable internet access and adequate data? What about phone connectivity? Do they have reliable cell or landline service? Do they have adequate minutes? Maybe they have all these things. Great, they have exclusive reliable access to a laptop, great data, great phone connectivity, but do they have a distraction-free space to work at home? I talked to more than 15 of y'all last week, and this was a common theme I heard from directors in Mississippi, is that they were still coming into the office because they needed a place free from distraction to do their work. If you need that, think about whether your staff need it as well. Other barriers can be technology access. Do you have enough licenses or do you have the professional settings for teleconferencing and virtual meeting software? Do you, your staff have webcams at home with which to record virtual programming? Do they have a scanner for an archive project that you're currently considering? Or, and this is the second most common reason listed in our most recent survey, do you have no remote work policy procedure or implementation plan in place yet? And if that's the case, look at the video description below. I've included an excellent sample remote work plan from an academic library. Next, once you've identified these barriers, work on removing them. So for example, provide technology and connectivity. If you're one of the libraries where you have staff that don't have exclusive access to the technology they need to do their job, consider staff loans. Do you have laptops that you use for tech classes or that you lend to patrons that you aren't currently using now that your building is closed? Consider long-term loans to staff who need dedicated access to a computer. Or if you have staff who have inadequate internet connectivity, please consider mobile hotspots and a data plan. Mississippi Regional Library System purchased a $20 mobile hotspot and a $50 five gig of data plan for two months with no contract. In a note about how rapidly evolving the landscape we're in is, when Josh Hayden, the director of the MIS, bought this hotspot, it was $20. When I first drafted this webinar two weeks ago, it was $69. And when I double checked the links last Friday, it was on back order. So please know, as with many things, you're going to have to adapt and things that look like a good plan now might not be available a week from now. Also consider free and no additional cost Wi-Fi phone options. Here at the Mississippi Library Commission, we love and endorse Google Voice and we'll be sending out instructions about how to use it at your library on all directors listserv. You can also use Microsoft Teams, which is available through your Office 365 subscription with the state. Or Zoom is another thing that libraries around the nation are using, though I usually put the usual asterisks on our current privacy and confidentiality concerns with Zoom. If you want to learn more about that, please feel free to email me. We're hoping that this is something that's rapidly evolving and they'll be addressing. But for now, as of today, there's still privacy and security issues. 
Also, identify why you're still coming into the building while your building is closed and triage those tasks and see if they're possible to either modify or suspend. So for example, consider pausing your vendor deliveries. Madison County Library System called all their vendors and asked them to hold any shipments. Anything they needed to have or could be paused was then rerouted away from the physical library. They also called the local post office to hold their mail for occasional pickup at the post office. Or if you're coming in to answer phones, like several of my libraries around the state currently are, consider a hunt group for answering phones. Now this is a more advanced technology option that I won't go into depth here, but please feel free to email me if you want to learn more about this option. A hunt group takes calls from a single phone number and distributes them to several phone lines based on availability. This is so you wouldn't have to change your forwards every day. It gives you more flexibility for how you staff a centralized phone number, such as a COVID information hotline or phone reference. And those of you who are interested in this, an example would be Jabber, which is a free plugin for Cisco WebEx. The main reason most of y'all report coming into the library is because you're still coming in to do bill pay and payroll. Really consider moving as many of those administrative tasks to digital options as possible. I really want to brag again on Todd Bigby Regional Library and Tana, the director there, who had the vision in the last several years to really push and work with her board to move to all digital accounting. She got board approval and buy-in to hire an accounting professional who worked with staff to set up online accounting. They moved with, from a software license for QuickBooks to QuickBooks Online. It cost them a few dollars more a year, but Tana says it's been well worth it. They also set up direct deposit for their payroll so staff don't have to come in to get their paychecks or handle paper. And they moved as many of their vendor bills and utility bills to online bill pay as possible. I also know this is something Lincoln Lawrence Franklin has been working on, and I really endorse this as a practice going forward. Also, another barrier can be communication. It's really important to communicate effectively as a team. What you see here is something called a channel map. I've taken this from Life Labs Learning's Complete Remote Work Playbook, which is incredibly thorough. Can be a little overwhelming in terms of information, but it is free and a wonderful resource as you make the transition for remote work and is available at the link below or in the video description. And what a channel map is, is a set of heuristics or rules of thumb for your staff about how you will communicate with them. And this will help them focus. So if they're worried that they need to check email throughout the day so they can find out about anything breaking or important that they need to do now, it'll be hard for them to set good practices around limiting work hours and focusing when they are working. I, for example, have a tendency to being a workaholic, which we'll cover later in this webinar. And I have a hard and fast guideline that I don't check email a hard and fast was very optimistic for a workaholic, but that I aspire to where I do not check email after 1 p.m. a day. And my libraries that I serve as a consultant and my coworkers and my boss know that if they need to reach me after 1 p.m., a phone call or a text is the best way to reach me in the case of an emergency. To wit, consider using phones only for urgent requests. Use only in emergencies or something that needs to be taken care of right now, as opposed to email, which could have a 24 to 72 hour response time turnaround depending on your system and the values of your system. And then only use text if you tried to call and couldn't reach them. Now, please be responsive to the needs of your staff. There was some great discussion in the live webinar about the needs of different people and how you really should understand that sometimes, as Shelley points out, that people are feeling alone, or as Katrina noticed, that email just doesn't cut it for those of us who are feeling isolated. Still, set up good practices that are understanding with that in mind, and if they're a phone person, be a phone person with them, but know that there's a consistent way that you communicate with them that they can trust and is reliable. Also consider Microsoft Teams chat for learning and connection. This is a place where you can share with each other not just the serious essential work that you're doing. Sometimes it's nice to show pet pics or an idea you heard in a webinar in a place that's not as stressful as an email right now. Or, you know, everyone loves a meme. Or not everyone, many of us love a meme. And then really consider video conferencing, and we'll get to this later in the webinar, for team and one-on-one -on -one meetings that are regularly scheduled on a weekly or bi-weekly schedule. And then what about your tasks for your truly disconnected workers? What is meaningful work that those who do not have internet 
connectivity or adequate phone minutes can do from home. First and foremost, a lot of us are looking at robust, low-touch, passive programming for both summer reading and just programming in general. So have your at-home work drop off once a week or whatever makes sense. The supplies to prep make and take kits for your summer library program. I know that both Northeast Library, Regional Library and Wilkinson County Library System are really doing thoughtful, um, insightful work to expand their passive program for the summer. And I've been really grateful for both of those libraries, D. Hare and Sheridan Montgomery, sharing what they're up to on our director's listserv to inspire other libraries. Or you can do what Beth in Winston County at the Mississippi Regional Library System or Sydney and his staff at Humphreys County Library are doing and call your vulnerable and socially isolated patrons to check in. It's a scary and anxiety inspiring time right now for all of us, and especially for our seniors who are solo householding and other at risk individuals. Calling to check in can be really meaningful for both your staff and for them. Also, I would note for any of my ideas that involve having your staff call people, please consider buying an affordable burner phone for your staff for any requirements you make of them using their phone. That way you protect both their privacy and confidentiality and you don't burn their minutes. For this next idea, which I love that I'm about to share, you could do this for a affordable iPhone, old, late model, you don't have to get new model iPhone burner. Please, I love this idea, someone please do it. Consider dial-in programming. Provide a phone for staff to run a dial-in book club. Maybe you have seniors who love your book club and it's just not a safe time for them to come into the library this summer. Have a dial-in book club. You just need one person who can convene it. You can combine landlines and cell phone lines. And we all know that book clubs are only 10 to 20% the book and the other 80 to 90% social. Give them an opportunity to connect with each other through the library and to share what they've been reading. Or do what Philip at Stark the Lock Tibaha and I have been talking about and have a dial-in jam session. Or if you're one of the awesome libraries in the state that host crafter circles, like a knitting circle, consider a dial-in knitting circle where people can knit at the same time and talk with each other. Or if you're one of our libraries that have a dial a story or have in the past, I know that for many of you, the numbers were down for that use, but I think what's old is new again. And as we're looking at serving vulnerable patrons who are socially isolated, having, or those of us who don't have high connectivity at home, consider having dial a story, but live. Now, how are you going to advertise these awesome services that you will hopefully be inviting me, Louisa Whitfield-Smith, to sometime this summer or fall when you launch them? Consider sending out postcards to your patrons to advertise your dial-in services. They don't have internet. How are they going to find out? You're running a great social media campaign advertising these services, but they don't have social media access at home. Or they're one of the people who don't have a phone book anymore. It's increasingly rare to have a phone book and they might have crashed into COVID-19 shelter in place like the rest of us without a phone number for the library at home. How are they gonna know what your phone reference line is or what your awesome dial-in programming line is? Send out postcards. And that brings us an elegant transition to strategy for success number three, which is many people's favorite section of this webinar many people who are not me, because we're about to talk about my myriad flaws during times of stress and the importance of self-management. In times of high stress, do you have a tendency towards fight, flight, or freeze? Couple things. First, really think about your own answer. There's not a bad answer here. There are strengths to each approach. Two, before I reveal those truths, let's guess what you think I have a tendency towards during times of high stress. I will count to three Mississippi. You can put your guesses in the comments below. Please know that in the live webinar, our directors batted a thousand and correctly guessing what my tendency is. So counting to three Mississippi. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, you can probably hear it from how I count. I absolutely have a tendency towards fight, especially in the initial stages of a high stress situation. I have a strong problem solving orientation and I'm a very action driven doer. And if I am not careful, I'm gonna try and solve that problem like five minutes ago as to 
instead of stopping and thinking through what the best solution will be, which is, again, why it's so important for us to build teams. I might be a great initial responder, but someone with a tendency towards freeze is going to sharpen that response and make it more thoughtful. And they might take in the research, think, and put together a great plan that I can be a practical person for helping implement it. There are strengths to each one of these approaches. It doesn't matter what you are, it matters that you know what your tendency is. So what is your management style under stress? How can you discover it if you don't know? The first place to start is like with that question we just did, in self-reflection. Think back over your patterns in life. Think about what you've done in the last two months and what you've done in other high stress times in your life. Also consider asking trusted others for input. A lot of my growth and how I operate under times of stress has come because I've been blessed to have coworkers who are willing to take the risk to be honest with me about my go-to moves during times of stress. And I'll be honest, y'all, they are not all good. And my growth would never have been possible if they hadn't been brave enough to tell me unpleasant truths about me. Also, consider online tests and resources. I love a BuzzFeed quiz too, y'all. Quizzes and other resources can help clarify your thinking and identify patterns in your behavior. For example, and again, all these links are available below in the video description. What's your stress personality? This is a great three minute quiz from Everyday Health that's been medically vetted. And I'm not just endorsing it because it told me I was Olivia Pope, but that's, let's be honest, part of it, though hopefully with better relationship choices than Olivia Pope. No offense, fans of that ship. <laughs> or if you're one of our directors or someone else around the nation who's gotten a lot of good out of the Myers-Briggs type indicator, like we did in our November 2019 Director Symposium here in Mississippi, consider this great more detailed resource from Psychology Junkie that goes in depth, and we'll get to it in a second, about how each MBTI type reacts to stress and how to help them. Or if you're research driven like I am, please consider this research based um, article, Want to Improve Your Style Under Stress, New Research Shows You How, that gives you tips for identifying and improving, improving your stress patterns so you don't alienate your staff. What are the strengths of your management style under stress? What are the risks? How can you mitigate those risks? Let's give you an example. Me. As I mentioned, and this is um, the section in which I'm going to talk even more in depth about my flaws. Uh, I have thought for years my Myers-Briggs type indicator type. Uh, for those of you who are not fluent in Myers-Briggs or who are skeptical, all right and good, please email me. I'd be happy to send you links or there'll be other sections of this self-management um, tip that will be more useful for you. But for those of us for whom MBTI has been useful and I count myself among them, I'm going to use this as an example. So I, Louisa Wofield Smith, apparently, I'm an ENTJ. <laughs> what stresses out an ENTJ? <sighs> Y'all, I'm about to air all my dirty laundry about stress. One, being in an environment that lacks a vision or ideas for the future. Two, and whew, this is so accurate for me, poorly managed change. Three, feeling guilt over being critical towards others. Y'all, I have what my mom politely referred to in third grade as a strong sense of right and wrong. And in times of high stress, that strong sense of right and wrong, if I'm not careful, can become a strong sense of super judgment. For example, I live next to a wonderful playground. It's wonderful. Any other season except for COVID-19, y'all. Because let me tell you, that first week I spent at the, na at the window, like that neighbor, you know that neighbor, watching the park, judgment in my eyes, as family after family brought their kids to play on the park, even after it was closed. Sorry, you can still hear the judgment in my voice. Because trust me, y'all, Jackson is not having the uh, human power to wipe down those jungle gym bars and swings after every kid who plays there. And you know, and I know the materials guidance that says COVID-19 per the March 17th NIH study um, 
COVID-19 can live up to 48 hours on stainless steel and 72 hours on plastic. And we know that this is a constantly changing guideline. So please feel free to email me or your consultant for the latest guidance on materials handling. So anyway, I was looking out my window, judging them left and right. I'm tempted, as I was in the live webinar, to show you what the name of my Wi-Fi is. It is the politest version I discussed with my friends, and it is ER staff use this park regularly. Also, I get stressed when I don't hear have my strongly held values, such as community responsibility to keep all of us safe, including those most at risk, if not just you and your children, and when those feelings aren't validated or respected by keeping your kids at home. <laughs> See, still hear that judgment in my voice. That can really stress me out. And I'm gonna talk about something uncomfortable, y'all. When I am experiencing stress, I may at first become argumentative and combative with anyone who is causing it. I'm glad that I've grown enough that I did home improvement projects instead of yelling at families that were just stressed out having their kids at home who needed a breath of fresh air. And I can take that into the workplace too. And again, I'm so grateful for my past colleagues who really helped me recognize and acknowledge the anger I felt because I'll be honest, I was raised as a female in the South, and anger just was never an emotion that I was taught was valid or one I could recognize in myself or access in any respective way. And it was in naming it that I could learn to grow past it. Also, and this part reads me so dirty, y'all, when I feel I am losing control, I can feel an urgent need to complete a task. If the stress continues, I can become distracted by this urgency and need to get something done. And if I am not self-aware enough and haven't learned the self-management to know that I want to push through this task right now, I can engage in compulsive and misdirected activities. And I can be trying to push through this thing that I believe needs to happen right now. But because I'm in problem solver, high energy, go, 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 do, do, do mood, mode, I am not explaining myself well. And people are very wisely putting up roadblocks and things for me to think through. And if I'm not careful, that can come across. And not just come across, I can be argumentative and combative. And that's why it's really important for you to recognize what your ghost to stress behaviors are. Because it might sound awesome to you right now to have some staff member who wants to go, go, go and to fix things. But imagine that in a boss. You're someone who doesn't need that and your boss is suddenly, and this is not a story from Mississippi, but it is absolutely something that happened in the US. You have a boss who's texting you at 9 p.m. on the weekend with some new initiative or new idea that they want to implement now. Imagine how stressful that's gonna be for your staff. So I'm feeling out of control. I have this strong doer impulse. I will absolutely engage in compulsive and misdirected activities like cleaning, counting, or inspecting. To wit, this is what I've worked on for the two, first two weeks when this all started. And for those of you without visual, it is a picture of a large custom bookcase with ordered books and alphabetized albums and doing out everything. And what I'm not even showing you is inside the cabinets. Send me an email, you know I'll send you pictures from inside the cabinets in which I have sorted my games, not only by how long they take to play, but the personality I think that would enjoy it and the subject matter. My craft activities are all in custom boxes of different craft types, whether it's the coloring box or a particular projects box with all the supplies and tools that I think I would need for it. So I can just take it out and use it because one of the many advantages of middle age all is increased self-knowledge. And I know that this is a safe place I can put my do-do-do instincts. This is a place I can exert control and do the most perfectionist to unpack of my life. Y'all, I did a usability and movement study for my kitchen. There were post-its involved in the motion study. And guess what? I'm a solo householder. I didn't inconvenience anyone. I didn't upset anyone. I didn't piss anyone else off. I didn't impose my values on my staff at awkward times of the day. I didn't stress them out. I just allowed my need for this to go someplace safe. Another example is last week when I, a librarian who works for the state, found out that I was gonna get to pay $1,800 to remove a dead tree. Yay. 
And this slide, it has a photo of said dead tree. It also has what I have been saving in my back pocket, knowing this about myself for just such a time as this. I had a project I was most looking forward to. And last Wednesday, after I got off the phone or email with 10 of y'all, after I'd heard y'all's stress, ideas, and anxieties that we're all feeling during this time, and at the end of that, I found out I could just pay $800 to remove a tree negotiated down for $21.50. I'm proud I am bragging. Um, I busted out the big gun. I busted out the project I had been saving. My deck refinishing. The picture on the right is that deck uh, broken down into thirds, pump treated, then waited for 15 minutes with a, uh, for pressure washing of a borax treatment. And you probably feel exhausted right now hearing about how excited I was to do my deck washing. But the next day when I was talking to my closest friends on the phone, he commented on how much better I sounded. And it was because I had had this meditative physical activity that had, as Kristen Chandler at Choctaw County refers to, visible progress on a physical task. So if you're one of those people who is exhausted hearing about how excited I am about my dang deck washing redo, remember, this is an object lesson, what works for you in times of stress does not necessarily work for your staff. Let me say this again. What works for you in times of stress does not necessarily work for your staff. And this means not only for us action-oriented doers, not imposing that on other people who are stressed out and scared, it means for those of you who need peace and calm and less responsibilities or to be left alone, please know that you might have direct reports that's not the case for, who need a phone call from you to reassure you or an email or a text to say, to answer their questions and to address their fears or to give them meaningful work to do. So let's talk about a concrete example. And a uh, fun, fun side note for those of you who are at the live webinar, as we discussed, said concrete example is when my contractor showed up with his concrete gun. Anyway, so what helps someone like me who finds use and value out of the label of an ENTJ and the Myers-Briggs? And for those of you, again, who are Myers-Briggs skeptics or aren't fluent in it, Consider this your big picture, strong sense of right and wrong, action-oriented types. For me, I need someone to give me space and time alone to sort out my feelings. That sounds amazing. I need someone who will listen to me and let me talk out, talk out what I'm thinking about, what I'm processing when I'm ready. Also, side note, big shout out to my boss, Lacey Ellenwood, our library development director. When I first found this list, she had done five out of seven items for me in the first couple of weeks. I need someone I can discuss information or ideas with that can lead to solutions. I don't want people to be overly sympathetic or emotional with me. I just want to get the work done. I don't care who does it. Someone needs to do it. Don't tell me I did a good job. Just do the dang work. I need a change of scenery. Getting outdoors is huge for me. It makes a big difference. Encourage me to trust my, uh, to vent my frustration without fear of judgment. The without fear of judgment is really important here for so many of us, not just us big picture action oriented types. And remind me that I'm okay and that it's perfectly fine for me to feel the way I do and that you won't judge me, which is great because I'm probably just confessing to you like I did earlier that I judge the heck out of so many people and feel so guilty about it. Now contrast that with what is a very common type for a library director in the state of Mississippi, an ISTJ. What does an ISTJ need? I need to brainstorm. I need to do. I need to not have my hand held. I just need to get the work done. Compare that to an ISTJ. <laughs> Third from the bottom, look at that. Don't brainstorm. If they're under the grip of stress, brainstorming will only make things worse. I need work to do. I need to be purposeful. While an ISTJ needs you to take work away from them. Give them a break from the responsibilities if possible. You need to break that task down into manageable pieces. And you also, like me, need to give them plenty of space. So think about it. Think about if I was managing a really amazing ISTJ employee and I was like, do, 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 or let's brainstorm solutions right now, stories I have heard from around this nation. How would that make that ISTJ feel? For those of you who identify with that or have been typed that in the past and it's been useful, how do you feel when you hear about my tech refinishing? 
and vice versa. So let's say you haven't, again, or, uh, drank um, from the cup of Myers-Briggs. You don't find it useful. You haven't typed your direct reports. How can you do this other component of emotional intelligence that's so important, relationship management? Well, first of all, this is the most important thing. Ask them what they mean and trust what they tell you. Again, ask them what they need. You don't know what your staff needs when they're stressed out? Ask them. And remember that you aren't the only person whose needs and strengths change under stress. An independent, detail-oriented doer might need reassurance and encouragement when they're usually this independent, awesome person who you have to give no direction to. Or an introspective, driven thought leader might need a break from their big picture responsibilities. Or a big picture thinker like me might need a detail-oriented physical project. One I've discussed with another director in the state who deals with stress in a similar manner to me is a major weeding project. And I think this is also important as we look to get our libraries reopened and we need to space our computers. Weeding lesser used systems that have become holy cows. And yes, I'm totally using this opportunity to discuss the floor print, the floor uh, print footprint of adult nonfiction in libraries in the state and around the nation. Does the amount of square footage you give adult nonfiction actually match the circulation it does in your system? Spoiler alert, unless you are the awesome Lori Barnes at Jackson George Regional Library System, it most likely does not. And if it's time for you to find additional spaces for what we anticipate, anticipate is increased computer need in the state as we reopen, really consider places you can weed collections that have gone unused for not just years, but decades. And if you're someone like me, consider giving them that project to do so that they have, again, sweet, sweet, visible progress on a physical task. And remember, we all need meaningful work. You're not giving someone like me a weeding project as a make work. You're doing it because it will empower the safety not only of your staff, but of your patrons as well, while providing access to as many computers as possible for increased needs for things like unemployment filings and job searches. So again, remember what we picked in tip number one, the most essential one or two things you are doing to serve your community during this time of crisis and communicate those one or two things to your staff and why they matter. And even better than communicating why they matter, make sure that you're giving them meaningful work. Now, how do you communicate that? Which brings us to our last strategy for success for today, which is the importance of weekly one-on-one -on -one check ins How do you communicate with your staff during ordinary times? Just normal day-to-day, month-to-month operations. How do you give them direction? How do they ask you questions or share ideas? Now consider why weekly one-on-ones are important, not just for normal times, if they ever come again, but for remote work and work going forward as we reopen. When working in person, your direct report can quickly see whether you're free. And again, everything I'm reading comes from Life Labs Learning, amazing complete remote work playbook. But at a distance, it's hard to know that your boss is free or your direct report is free. I don't know if Lacey's walking her awesome dogs. She doesn't know if I'm yet again doing something like refinishing my deck. Directs won't want to bother you. So they will sometimes let questions linger, go rogue with projects or seek advice elsewhere. Having a consistent, reliable time together, ideally every week, means they can count on this time to ask questions and share challenges. It helps you get out ahead of stuff instead of letting some issue or question fester unanswered for three months until it's a much more complicated thing to solve. Also, consistent one-on-ones become signal-setting actions with your staff, communicating your care, availability, and reliability to them in this time of high stress. Weekly one-on-ones. So let's say you've never done them before. It's been a long time since you've done them. Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of doing a remote weekly one-on-one. -on -one. First, pick the communication channel that works best for your staff. An example of this would be the first choice, depending on connectivity for your staff, which is video messaging or video conferencing. You can use Teams for this. I know that Sunflower County Library uses Google Hangouts. Many libraries also use Zoom. Whatever works best for you, I trust. Why video conferencing? Maybe you're like me and you don't love the sight of your face on video. Guess what? It's scientifically proven that most of us don't because of something called the mirror effect. But we also know from studies 
that seeing each other's faces help build uh, helps build trust. Again, that word trust. So if it's possible for your staff to do it by video, please do. Otherwise, take into account things like broadband access or data access. Then, once you pick the communication channel that works best for your staff, have a consistent, regularly scheduled time that is opt out, not opt in. Don't have to reinvent the wheel every week while starting a complicated negotiation about what time it will be. Have it be a set time, like Tuesdays at 8.30 or Thursdays at 3. And then all, any email communication around the meeting is about if you have to reschedule it, not having to freshly schedule it every week. And again, this is about consistency and stability in a stressful time. And then once you're in this weekly one-on-ones, it's your job to listen. Listen, people. Listen, fellow talkers. And also know that during stress, sometimes those of us who are really talkative become really quiet. And sometimes those of us who are really quiet normally become really talkative. So don't be surprised if your staff switch their communication styles with you during a time of high stress. And when you're in these phone calls, ask open-ended questions. Questions that are open-ended begin with things, good words like what or how. Stay away from why. Why is a conversation killer, even for big picture thinkers like me? Also, stay away from simple yes or no questions. Instead, ask these open-ended questions. An example would be, instead of asking, are you okay? Or are you and your family okay? You could instead ask, how are you doing? And prepare one work-related question a week that you are asking all staff. Share this in advance. Remember, not all of us like to brainstorm. In fact, most of us in a stressful situation probably don't like to brainstorm. By sending them this question ahead of time, it gives them a chance to really thoughtfully process it. An example of such a question might be, what do you think our community needs on social media from us right now? Or what are some modifications you anticipate we'll need to be doing with our senior programming? To recap, for four successful strategies, congratulations, you are almost done. You are in the home stretch. One, focus on one to two essential services your staff can provide safely and remotely. Two, identify and remove barriers to remote work. Three, manage yourself. Four, have weekly one-on-one -on -one check ins and if you're going to remember two things from this webinar, and let's be honest, I really believe in the Father Guido Sarducci School of Educational Theory. If you don't know who that is or you want a really joyful reminder, please scroll to the bottom of the links below and click on amazing YouTube video. And that means that if you, like me, have been in something like a dozen webinars in the last month, a dozen might be on the low end. It could be 850. I don't know anymore. You know and I know you're not going to remember everything I talked about today. So if you're only going to remember two things, and I am flattering myself that it's even going to be two things. Remember these two things. One, pick one truly essential thing your library can do during this time and focus your time, staff, and resources on doing that thing well. And two, have weekly one-on-one -on -one check ins with your staff. So that's it, everyone. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments below or email me at louisa at mlc.lib.ms.us. I know that our time is taxed on so many directions right now, and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this. Thank you.